very small fan. If you're wearing a coat, please feel free to remove it or anything else that makes you comfortable. Watch it, though. <laughs> The emergence of a group of non-profit, non-museum, alternative spaces has been one of the most interesting developments on the New York art scene in the last few years. And throughout the United States, one of the most significant of those alternatives is the Institute for Art and Urban Resources. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guests tonight are the founder, president, and executive director of the Institute for Art and Urban Resources, Alana Heiss, and one of the artists who has worked and exhibited there, Richard Nonis. A very warm welcome to both of you. Alternate space is a loose phrase that seems to encompass many forms. Virtually without exception, it did not exist before 1970. Why don't we begin by your telling us what does alternative space mean? Who coined the phrase? What is its meaning? And what is its purpose? Why don't we begin with you, Alana? Because I guess by general acclamation, you are the godmother. <laughs> I, I appreciate your use of godmother rather than grandmother, which <laughs> is frequently applied to me and makes me feel very old. Um, we had a enormous conference this last spring out in Los Angeles and this was the first official meeting of uh, groups, organizations, etc. between the very loose and the very formal from all of the United States and Canada. The intention of this conference um, was after eight years of all these different kinds of, of spaces opening up all over the United States and, and Canada and Europe, which were generally given the, the name alternative space. One of the goals of the three-day conference was to uh, define the term alternative space. And this turned out to be unfortunate because we, we got bogged down on that one question and, and the conference almost collapsed over it. Uh, I think that it was clear to all those who attended, several hundred people, that the one thing you could say about alternative space is the one unifying factor was that none of them were the same. Um, basically a negative definition. Uh, Kenneth Burke, uh, in talking about definitions in general, you know, he's, he's a philosopher, puts down the idea of negative definitions, uh, that there is no such thing as negative space or negative definitions. But one thing uh, I've been able to observe throughout the years is that most of our programs are built up uh, from a negative definition, i.e. there is a whole, uh, something is not happening somewhere for uh, some sort of art, and we form a program which responds to that, to that whole. Uh, through the years in the development of alternative spaces who also tend to act in a similar way, um, eventually and hopefully this negative situation is resolved in a positive way. Something else happens. Maybe the museum takes on a, a similar program. And then that leaves the alternative space with a lack of explanation um, in a positive way as to why they did what they did. So this is kind of important when we continue to talk about this. Most things grow up because there simply isn't that thing to take care of that thing, and the program is conceived in Was this, this then a spontaneous generation? As I recall, if one were to draw a timeline, the very first one was probably 112 Green Street, about 1971, and the kitchen soon thereafter, and not soon yeah. after, long after that. Well, basically it was 112 a year before uh, I formally organized the Institute. It was 112 and the Institute um, beginning, and I would credit 112 and Jeffrey Liu specifically with the uh, kind of energy which began the first, the first such space. However, it's interesting to talk about 112 because it was, it was very, very different uh, from what grew up later. And m m I like Jeffrey Liu and I'm friends with him and we've often worked together. My purpose in forming the Institute was to, as a non-artist myself, as an administrator, a person who has frequently worked with museums and establishment organizations, to set up a formal administrative group uh, which would 
formalize exhibitions, imply that they had the quality that required collectors and curators to notice them, uh, and to branch out and deal with the powers that be on a museum and city bureaucracy level. Now, Richard Nonis, who was, of course, involved with the core group of 112 artists uh, the year approximately before the Institute was formed, should speak in two both organizations because they're very, very, in a very interesting way, very different. And while you do that, Richard... And also we, very similar. Very similar. Uh, at least at the beginning, we're very similar. The, the, the situation that existed then was, uh, has a lot to do with what Alana described, which is there were a group of artists who had work they wanted to do, and there was no place to do it. There just wasn't any place to do it. We had stuff that we wanted to do that the museums weren't interested in, the galleries didn't want to touch, and we were all not only ready, but anxious to work. I mean, we were, we were going to do it no matter what. And uh, it was a time and a group of artists, some of whom knew each other, some of whom didn't know each other. But when we came in contact with each other, found that we were thinking in similar ways. It was a time when there was work that we wanted to do, and we weren't going to wait any longer. You'd waited about 10 years, you should say. There was a 10-year yeah. span in here. Uh, the, you know, usually artists can't show work the first four or five years that they're in New York. These groups of artists had been bubbling in the cauldron, you see, and the minimal artists, Judd, Sarah, and those people, pretty much had it sewn up with Castelli and everyone else. And this group was the group that just followed them, and they, they couldn't break, break into it. Yeah, so there were really two wasn't... factors. One, that there was not enough gallery space for the numbers of artists who wanted to show, and two, were stylistic differences. Well, yeah, but it was more than that. It was also that what we wanted to do was stuff that even if the galleries were willing to show us, they weren't willing to have done to their galleries. If you want to make a hole in the floor, you can't do it in 420 West Broadway, which didn't exist at that point. But you couldn't do it in an uptown gallery. If you wanted to, uh, uh, you know, there were certain ways or certain rules of dealing with gallery space or museum space, which at that time seemed pretty clear. And we wanted to do something else. So the situation was that we simply were dealt with this energy. And the way that we dealt with it was, one, by starting a space ourselves, which was uh, 112 Green. Which was in uh, your own gallery. Yeah, which was, which was a strange situation where someone had, uh, through a series of very devious uh, uh, maneuvers, had talked himself into a building. Mainly with gangsters. Right, yeah, sure. And, and, the, and the ground floor was empty. So the ground floor was empty anyway. Let's make a gallery. Well, let's make something. And of course, uh, whether it was called a gallery or not, wasn't the point. It was significantly different from any gallery that existed. And it was just, uh, uh, the man who owned the building was an artist, and uh, he basically controlled it, except that his friends wouldn't let him get away with anything. So in effect, we all controlled it, despite the fact that it was in no sense a cooperative. And that was what 112 was to begin with. At about that same time, uh, one of the people who was around and who was aware of this energy was a woman who nobody knew, except that she happened to be living with one of the group of artists. And that was Alana. Conspiracy. And Alana details. knew what was going on, and she knew what our needs were. And uh, one day Alana said, I had decided that I wanted to do a show. I had stuff that I wanted to show. And Alana came to me one day and said, look, Richard, I found a building. There's been a fire in it. The floor is completely uh, buckled. The windows are covered with, with, uh, with uh, uh, plywood. There are no lights in it. But it's a big space, and I can get it for you. Do you want to do something in it? And I said, sure. And that was the beginning of the Institute. I mean, that was the we first, go, that, well, that was the first one-man show that Alana Before did. we go to the Institute, yeah. let's ask one question about what was going on throughout the United States. Uh, until the meeting you mentioned in Los Angeles, was there any communication between these groups of alternative spacers, or was it just spontaneous generation that occurred in various locales? Well, there's, we're talking about an, an eight-year period of time. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there wasn't anything going on in the rest of the United States that, that uh, mirrored 112 or the Institute for the first, say, three or four years. There started to be rumblings. I got to travel some and talk to people, and they expressed interest and decided how they would form things, their places. One of the first was a Los Angeles Institute for Contemporary Art. In about 73, they started trying to figure out how they could get something together. That started basically as an artist's union and changed into 
uh, an alternative space. There had been some efforts, usually through radical curators like Seth Sigalov, yeah. um, to gather together interest-related artists form a show outside of a museum and then place it in a museum or a university museum. And I was in communication and they were in communication with me. People like Seth and, and, and you know, various often Marxist related curators. This all comes out of a museum complex. So there really hadn't been spaces established, to my knowledge, yet in, in what we're talking about. Well, let's tell about seven. Come back to along about 70, 71. And for all the um, improvisational beginnings, the clock tower, which is atop the old New York Life Insurance building, a 1912 McKim, Mead and White, wonderful structure, probably the most beautiful exhibition space in the city, and PS1, an abandoned 1890s red brick Romanesque revival, abandoned school in Queens, are very much a part of the art scene. Now you tell us please, Alana, how and when and where did they evolve? Which came first? And how did the clock tower and PS1 form together to become the Institute? Well, the, the first clarification is the name. Um, chose purposefully a very pretentious name from the very beginning. Pretentious or establishment? Both pretentious and establishment. And most important, extremely difficult to remember. <laughs> uh, there was a reason for this, many reasons, and I'll go through. Institute for Art and Urban Resources uh, did genuinely Im imply in, in an organization that was directed towards eventually uh, being linked to the establishment institute. It was going to umbrella a variety of projects through the years which it could hold on to or drop. Uh, it could umbrella the activities of a variety of individuals, either curatorial or artistic or whatever. So institute implies more than one person, more than one place, and that was purposely chosen. All the projects have separate names and always You were the, then the institute. Yeah, Absolutely. I was the, I was the institute. Absolutely, completely, yeah. It was a big fraud in the very beginning. The reason that it was... And maintained that uh, character for a number of years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the reason it, we wanted it to be very difficult to remember was we were constantly getting summons and various kinds of subpoenas, violations. violations, and so on. And also, it was convenient when people confused it with other things that, in fact, had more prestige. Such as the Institute for yeah. Architecture and um, urban. Uh, urban Studies, a, a, a remarkably interesting organization which has received through the many call, uh, years <coughs> phone calls relating to our activities, which often took place in abandoned buildings and like Richardson underneath the Brooklyn Bridge and all these exciting things. Few people, by the time they got home, uh, to complain about what was going on could remember the combination of words Institute for Art and Urban Resources, they, Institute for Art and Urban Studies, they couldn't find it in the phone book, and so on and so on. And there were many, many, many projects. The first one was the, was exhibition related, the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, in the beginning- was this while you were still at the Municipal yeah, Art that Society? that was the tail end. It was done, sponsored by the Municipal Art Society. In the beginning, I believed we wouldn't keep any space. We would go exhibition, exhibition, exhibition space, and never have a single space for very long. Um, that theory became unwieldy after a year, and we started holding on to spaces. Uh, the warehouse shows that Richard began, happened at 10 Leaker Street. We did things in scrap yards, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, Coney Island. Coney Island. There was a Coney Island Museum for about three years, which was fascinating. It was in a Neptune Beverage Company out in the uh, bombed out areas in Coney Island. And that operated as a studio for sculptors to do a piece. And at the end of their term that they would do a piece, uh, when they would decide it was ready, we would send out mailers to the Coney Island Sculpture Factory and Museum, and people would come out, see the show, and leave. So it was uh, an experiment in that. The Idea Warehouse was another early. This happened the same time as the kitchen, and it was our attempt to operate a performance space. And it was a year-long project. At the end of the year, the Idea Warehouse uh, closed very effectively, in this case, with a fire. Um, the, I <laughs> the Idea Warehouse was an enormous warehouse on the sixth floor. It was the largest space, largest loft available, and it had performance art. The artist got a, a month to work out a performance piece. At the end of a month, uh, there'd be a public 
visitation. And that's the place that Phil Glass opened it with premiered music in 12 parts. Scott Burton did a giant installation. Nonis did a show. Um, and we went through Charlemagne, Charlemagne Palestine, uh, Sylvia Whitman, and Bob Whitman. And we went through nine occasions in which people made work to the space. And it was incredibly powerful incredibly successful and lasted one year and then we dropped it, which was a good, it turned out to be a good policy. What happened with the clock tower? And what year are we in now so that we can follow this uh, chronology? They, they loop over each other and it's very difficult, but the clock tower came around about 73. And it was so difficult to get, it took us about two years. At that point, Frank Colbert had joined me. He's now Col Joel Colbert Gallery and he was the assistant director. Uh, and as I said, it took about two years of negotiation to grasp the clock tower from the city of New York and grew more official and more official as the years went by. It was so hard to get that we ended up just keeping it and it became um, very glamorous and very chic very quickly. It was not intended to be that. It was intended since we ran all these scrapyard and warehouse shows all the time and the public would come, thousands of people. I wanted another project that was very reclusive and very private where very few people would come. So I decided I'd been on the street, I wanted to go into the, the air. We, I looked at towers all over New York and found the clock tower and we started it as a, a place where the individual could come and look at work and feel as though he or she owned it. The same kind of relationship that a collector has with work and spend hours, undisturbed hours. Unfortunately, it became extremely successful right away and crowds of people started coming. Uh, then it became unsuccessful, and then crowds of people didn't come and went back to this old clock tower thing, and then it became successful again, and it went back and forth for years. What Alana's not mentioning is that the space is, is a really outrageous one. It's, uh, it's in a building that's, that's, that are, it's courtrooms. It's where you go to pay your, your parking violations, and there are uh, all sorts of, of, of small claims courts, and some actually low-level criminal courts in the building, oh. too. So when you walk in, you walk through this, this, this crowd of bailiffs and, and defendants and people who are really worried and, and uh, I mean just as far away from a gallery as it's possible to be. But yet it's a, a, a very official kind of office building. Then you go up in the elevator, get out at the top floor, have to walk through a sort of extra stairway that is a little difficult to find, and you end up in this, this wonderful <coughs> clock tower. Uh, the very beautiful, beautiful, <coughs> special space. So it started out sort of as a welfare organization for artists in many ways. <laughs> you know, in a very, um, that's not really. Um, we had some projects which could be interpreted to be socially useful, um, such as the studio program, which I'd worked on in London for, when I lived there for four years. We used to try to get the city to turn over vacant buildings for, to be temporarily used as workspaces for artists. Was the St. Catherine's Dock experience of yours really the inspiration for looking for more working space for artists for, here? Sir, as far as the workspace program, mm -hmm. perhaps you should briefly so. describe what that uh, project was. Uh, this was something that began in London in about 67, and the situation in London was very different than New York. The artists were spread out all over, and they had no central communication point. And people's studio space was non-existent. London was like Soho is now, in a sense, or a hundred years later, um, people had already taken over mews and spaces like that and had been living there for hundreds of years, and then they were very chic living spaces, and the whole transfer of industrial to private domestic use had gone on like 200 years ago. Artists had really no, nowhere to work. And Bridget Riley, who is an English painter, and Peter Sedgley, who is also an English painter, were able to wrangle from the London government, uh, the London County Council, use of huge, huge dock land, old 18th century warehouses, for a period of three years only, which point is going to be torn down. And I was uh, employed on this project, and about 150 artists had studios, work studios, in this uh, project. And I worked on that for about four years. So you decided to try to transfer that idea to New York City? Yeah, the workspace part of it. Mm -hmm. I'd also worked for museums and found that uh, experience not terribly rewarding and wanted to transfer museum activities into raw space situations. So it was a combined thing. Then we come to, sense? indeed, to PS1. Sure. Oh, the <laughs> culmination. I guess, sorry? The financial culmination of our 
Well, you're not going to get to that yet. Let's first talk about the artistic <laughs> inspiration for it. And that is, I guess, a space that was, is now a little more than two years old in Queens. It gave you the idea to expand the institute to include PS1. And what is PS1? PS1 stood, of course, for Public School One. It was the first school built under the system of New York public education, which actually had identified public schools. It was, when it was first built in 1890, it was called Ward School One. Uh, it was built by the mayor of the then mayor of Long Island City, which is a teeny weeny village perched on the river that stares at New York. It's not really part of Queens uh, aesthetically. It's its own village. It's just across the 59th Street Bridge. Uh, just yep. across the 59th Street Bridge. And it had a mayor. And the mayor had perhaps received postcards from places in Europe like Granada, <laughs> Versailles, whatever. And he decided that the school which was built to, to uh, teach the children of his village uh, would be a personal monument to him. He was an, an old-time New York politician and that, that this would reflect his power and glory through the ages and he must have instructed the architect to incorporate into PS1 remarkable achievements of European Gothic and pseudo-Gothic architecture and uh, it's truly a monument to the mayor of Long Island City. It's pink <laughs> and big and has towers and gargoyles and anything the heart desire and it's immense. It's actually two schools and one are joined in a giant U. It has courtyards and tunnels and it's just phenomenal. And of course, about 10 years ago, uh, population radically changed in Long Island City. The, the people started moving out, the Italian working class people started moving out into the Queens suburbs, and there simply weren't enough children in Long Island City to, to validate having their own school. Um, and there the school sits. Every single person who still lives there went to PS1. There's, not a, there's no one that you can encounter on the street who didn't go to PS1 and whose father and mother didn't go to PS1 and whose grandfather didn't, and grandmother didn't go to PS1. So it's a highly unique situation. The residents of that neighborhood, there are no new residents and uh, they all went there. And that school was abandoned. The roof was pretty much caved in and it was going to be torn down. And that situation, like very stupid angels, we intervened. <laughs> <laughs> How did you discover the school? We had decided that we needed a, a more permanent location, which we, would, we couldn't invest money in short-term, large-scale situations. And we needed large-scale, somewhat permanent locations where, tr where trucks, materials, uh, excess supplies, exhibitions, studios could take place that we wouldn't be switching all the time. We wasted a lot of time starting out projects, running them for two years and putting, you know, and so on. We needed a single location that was extremely large. We were interested in, in the docks and the warehouse area in Brooklyn and all over. We wanted to decentralize, get out of Soho, and put this thing someplace else, right outside of the borough of Manhattan. Um, mm -hmm. And we went to the borough presidents uh, to discuss with the different borough presidents who really wanted a program. After, we were pretty well known at this point and had a lot to offer. The borough president of Queens got very excited and he knew that he had a problem on his hands because the neighborhood didn't want PS1 torn down. And he suggested that we look at it and said, if you do this, you'll have our support. Is the neighborhood at all involved with PS1 now? Yes and no. Um, the, the, positively, they are pleased that it wasn't torn down. It has been, brought great financial rewards to the community in the sense that lots of people go out there that didn't. It's the first thing that's happened in Long Island City. It's the first thing that... Since that unnamed mayor. <laughs> for at least 20 years. Um, no new companies have moved in. Nothing has happened there. We happened. We're not a community museum. We're, we're not responding educationally to the community. We don't have the kind of money, the kind of projects. They come to the shows frequently, more so when the shows involve realism and photography than other. They know the building pretty much, and on Sundays, everybody comes there with the kids. It's a, a relationship which is built on combination of disinterest and uh, acceptance. It's 
Just sort of like that. We're not you involved with Project Studios One from the very beginning. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that that we should mention is that is that all of us are always looking for space. I mean, the, a lot of need space in terms of, of the institute, and, and, and there are a lot of artists around who need space just to work. So we, uh, we always have our eyes open, and that's a building that, in fact, we had seen, because you can see, when you drive on the Long Island Expressway, you can see it there. And as you can see in that poster, it's really a strange-looking building. It's this enormous hulk, completely isolated from the rest of the neighborhood. And it's very visible. And it's, it's, it's one of the buildings that we always fooled around about. You know, there are maybe 10 buildings in the city that Alana and I have said over the years, wouldn't it be great to have that building with no What else is on your hit list? Thought. Oh, there are a lot of them. <laughs> but in any case, there your it house, was. Barbara. <laughs> and one day, Alana called me and said, come over and look at this building. And we went there, and the roof was collapsed. The entire uh, one entire wing was covered in water. It was completely filled with water. You needed boots to go. I, you know, it was, it was literally uh, uh, almost knee deep in water in some of the rooms. I mean, it was just completely outrageous. It was so outrageous that it was perfect. I mean, it was just, it was just so ridiculous for Lana to get hold of this building. It was, it was 10 times the size of anything she'd ever dealt with. The, the amount of money that was required was so completely beyond anything that seemed feasible that it just was perfect. Why not? And. Uh, now you've just we all got very excited about it, both the artists and, and uh, Alana and, and the people that she was dealing with administratively. There must have been a lot of conceptual artists it. involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody becomes conceptual at that level. As I recall, the uh, city, it's projected the cost of renovation at something like a million and a half dollars. And you somehow managed to scrape together $150,000, oh, yeah. I assume by some great loan from someplace. Somewhere. A loan from Chemical Bank. And what did you do with that $150,000? Well, Brendan, who you'll meet next week, was Brendan Gill is the distinguished man who has been chairman of the board since day one and has borne out through all these very, very bizarre activities. He's also chairman of the board of like the Victorian Society and a variety of other organizations, which we are sort of Brendan's uh, underground activity for the world, you know. Really. <laughs> and uh, he has protected us and helped us through the years. Of course, Brendan was brought out to PS1. He burst in to help us laughter. And uh, <laughs> he had Richard Nonis's identical reaction. He said, oh, why not? I mean, there's no way to explain this, but go ahead. And what we did with the $150,000, and a crucial $150,000 startup grant from the New York State Council for the Arts, due to the intercession of the then chairman, Joan Davidson, was we decided to absolutely no cosmetic renovation. Uh, we were only peripherally interested in rehabilitation of the building architecturally. We didn't rebuild any of the gargoyles. We couldn't get into the great landmarks controversy over whether the tiles on the roof had to be replaced with original <coughs> tiles, this sort of thing. Uh, we said, OK, we're going to fix the roof so it won't rain in. To keep the water out. To keep the water out. We're in the snow. By that time, PS1 took about a year to develop. There was a lot of snow at that point. Uh, people could build snowmen in the building in almost any room. Uh, we're going to rewire the building so we can have light, and we're going to take all the trash out of the building so we can walk through it. And the fourth but carefully d deliberated decision was, for architectural renovation was, and I guess we'd better rebuild the floors where and when they are completely gone. Right? Those were the considerations for redoing PS1. We had the buildings department. We fulfilled every code requirement correctly for public use, but absolutely at, at the minimum. And we've kept it this way. Um, we have two areas in the building that were so bad, there were no floors, there were no ceilings, that we did rebuild those in what is seen to be polished museum terms. Um, we intentionally did them, since we had to do them anyway, we did them in the most formal and grandiose manner. Consequently, we have beautiful, huge exhibition space out there, one wing. We also have it's a 25,000 feet. 25,000 square feet. It's one of the, well, it's the largest single series of galleries. Seven rooms, seven beautiful rooms. Beautiful galleries uh, of any museum that in the states, in the states, in the city, because we don't have a collection. You say other, others are larger, but they have collections. 
and we have a beautiful auditorium for performance work. We have new floors on that and everything. The rest of the building, and when you come out and see us, uh, or if you, for those of you who have been are familiar, is totally peeling paint and the whole thing, and there is no intention of, of doing anything about that. And people <laughs> frequently come to me and they say, oh, Lana, now that things are going so well, won't it be nice when you can get this hall painted? Well, it ain't going to happen because why? Uh, um, the, the character of the building, we're not going to spend money that way. Uh, the character of the building is what it is. As long as it has the current use, which is a combination artist center, artist experimental work center, artist exhibition space in which primarily people who are really involved with contemporary art go out there with their kids, they wander around. There's no reason for it to have to be uh, done up. Um, if you want, if the done up part is the gallery, you can go through there and you won't be offended. It's as nice as the modern. And the other thing is what I said originally, that there's a lot of work mm -hmm. that people want to do, that artists want to do, that demands spaces that can be attacked, that can be modified, that can be changed. And if Alana, Alana has just spent this, this uh, hard stolen money on renewing a place, obviously you can't cut holes in it. But the rest of the building can yeah. be cut. Right. And uh, has been right. over and over again. Now you've described alternative space nationally. <laughs> locally. We know what the building looks like. <laughs> Tell us about the four programs that are housed within PS1. What are their goals? What is the purpose? Why don't you start? Uh, well, I am not, I, I've never thought of it in terms of four programs, but I, I know that certainly one of the things that Alana has been involved in pretty consistently is providing spaces for people to experiment in people to try things which, in fact, they can't try anywhere else. Their studios aren't big enough or, and, and also aren't public enough. Uh, and the galleries and museums don't want to touch that kind of work. And Alana has always made that possible for a fairly large group of people. It started out being a relatively small group of people. Well, but as things expanded, uh, in fact, more people become involved. How large? Why don't you tell us about the well, first exhibition in 1976? Well, the, the, PS, the first PS1 oh, that's show. The, that's the room show. Oh, yeah is uh, uh, Alana had just gotten the building. Nothing had been fixed up. The only thing that had been fixed up was the roof had been fixed. Uh, the wiring had been done. But the building was, other than that, the way it, the way it had been. The, there was no longer water on the floor, but all the damage from the water was still there. And what Alana did was, was uh, what turned out to be an absolutely perfect thing. She just invited something like 70 artists, was it? How many? 78. Were, 78 artists and said, look, pick out a space and do anything you want. And we Why all went not? out there <laughs> and we took a room or we took a hallway or we took a bathroom or we took part of the cellar or we took part of the attic or part of the roof and just did anything. Gordon Monaclaw cut a hole that went through four stories of the building. Uh, uh, what did you do? I took a, a, a hallway that was, uh, in fact, the hallway that was so bad that the floor originally afterwards had to be replaced. and. Uh, uh, just in this complete shambles of a hallway built a, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, not something like a 60 foot long steel sculpture that went through two and a half rooms. Just continued through that space, tied them all together and really changed the whole feeling of the space. Entitled but without clearing it at all. It was called uh, uh, Alligator, I believe. Oh, Alligator yeah. is yeah. your first piece there, yes. And uh, That was your piece. Well, the, uh, you that. can't really see it, but in the photographs, in the photographs, it would be good. But it was uh, it was a, a kind of space that didn't exist anywhere else in the city, or if it existed, wasn't available. And everybody used the spaces differently. Uh, the, most of the spaces are classroom, or were at that time classroom spaces. And people came in, they tore out the blackboards if they wanted to, they removed doors if they wanted to, they built enormous cement mounds if 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 that was what their work was about. Nobody hesitated to do anything they wanted to do. And it doesn't exist anywhere else in the city. And there was, for that show, 78 artists who spent at least a month working out there very excitedly and produced a show which I think is probably had a kind of excitement that no show since then has had. It was quite an amazing experience. We are often flattered to find out that this is considered as sort of the definitive show of the 70s in terms of 70s work. Um, it, was a, it was 
artists from all over the world, so that helped. They all got together in one spot, and that created kind of energy, which was just phenomenal. Which is not to say that all the work was great. No, some a of lot it was of it was good, real terrible. It wasn't. Yeah. But it was all exciting, because people really got involved in that process. The other thing is that uh, while the building had been renovated up to code, as Alana said, it had been done in the minimal possible way. So the day of the opening, there were two fires. <coughs> I mean, so up to the last minute, it wasn't sure that the opening was going to happen because the fire department was there, ready to close the building. Yeah. But in fact, somebody pushed them, you know, and, and stroked them, and that was OK. And it's been that way ever since. Alana, you tell us then about the four programs and how I'm dividing it as studio space. That's correct. About how Project studios. Performance space and exhibition space. You just did it, Bob. But now, will you describe what that means? Okay. Uh, at PS1, our our programs, which are often separately floating around in other parts and other of the city that we run otherwise, and they're sort of all unified at PS1. Approximately half the building are used for work studios that artists get on a one-year basis. They are awarded by a panel. Who they, selects those artists? A panel. Uh, I select the panel, the panel selects the artists. <laughs> and who um, are the panelists that make they this They change choice? every year. Uh, there are artists who have had studios there. they are curators who see a lot of work. Uh, one, or, one person perhaps from the neighborhood of the Queens area. And on what basis are they selected? They, they're selected on a combination of need, of interest in the work, and the interest, because any time you award an artist's studio, which is a sub, at a sub, subsidized rental, thanks to the New York State Council, uh, you are basically backing their work. And uh, is the studio in X classroom? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they have it for a year, and uh, it's sometimes renewable for another year, never more than two. There's no build-up. The same artists aren't always at PS1. And, uh, so each one lease change. need not necessarily lead to another. No. no. And hopefully new people are brought in all the time. And the third requirement, need uh, value of work and ability to use that particular space fairly frequently will cause us to choose one artist who we really feel will use it every day or you know quite a bit opposed and how to many artists, artists in residence so to speak about there? 40 part of that program is also an international studio program and that's become very important uh, we work with different countries who are members of the international program at the Institute and an artist is invited to come from France, from Germany, from the Netherlands, from Canada, from Australia, Sweden, Sweden and they receive a stipend, a living stipend, uh, so they, they live around in Soho or wherever they live and they have a studio out there and at the end of the year they are, have a studio exhibition. So we're trying to integrate artists from... Is one obliged to exhibit at PS1 if they have a studio there? Of the other program? In the exhibition in the, space. In the international program is one of budged? Yeah, in any no, of the in programs. The, in the, uh, one is, one cannot uh, exhibit in any of the exhibition spaces unless, if, if, one has, if one has a studio. Cannot. Cannot, unless you are specific, specifically invited to show by the person who's curating the exhibition just because they happen to have seen your work in the studio. There is no, no overlap there. Well, who determines what is shown in the exhibition space? Different programs, different things. You understand the workspace program. OK, those are studios. The second program. That's studio space, workspace program. That's studio one. space, OK. The second program are called special projects. And that is what we pulled out of the room show. Instead of having the whole building like this, we have one wing, which is kept very raw, which anything can be done. There are, say, 20 areas. And each, each term, each two-month term, we have four terms, each two months long, uh, an artist is curatorially chosen and asked to do a project in, a special project in one of these variety of spaces, rooms, halls, roofs, whatever. And that's called special projects, and that's really what Richard was talking about. Those are chosen uh, you know, in a curatorial fashion, generally by myself, and my staff who recommend. And they, the proposals come from all over the world, uh, not at particularly at our invitation. And then we go through all these proposals, and we choose about 20, 30, 40, sometimes every couple months. Uh, the third is the exhibition program, taking place in the formal galleries. Guest curators curate those exhibitions. Occasionally, I do one. Uh, but what I like to do is invite critics or curators at, at uh, other museums to, to form exhibitions. The current one, for instance, is called Another Aspect of Pop Art. 
Some of you may have read the review uh, by John Perot a couple weeks ago. It was curated by a man named Per Jensen, who's a Danish curator. And it's a very formal exhibition. And sometimes we have traveling shows and things like that. Um, the fourth is the performance program. And this is kind of a limp program right now because of, of a number of situations, one of which we didn't receive enough funding this year to back the performers like we need to. And um, we're, we're working that we The performance program is obviously what it is. It's up in the auditorium, and uh, there are performances. PS1 obviously attempts to provide a very flexible environment that supports and encourages the production first and then the presentation right. of 70s and 80s art by your own definition in this nice book. Now, my question... So now, <laughs> now I know what we can say. It's the production and then the presentation. And the presentation is as closely related to the method of production as is logically and aesthetically possible. And you describe it as 70s and 80s art. In both of your views, what is 70s and 80s art, particularly since the earlier reference, and often repeated, that that opening exhibi exhibition of rooms with 78 artists was, so to speak, the definitive That's exhibition. That's not my statement. That was, a, that was um, someone else's. 70s art. What is 70s and 80s art? Ask known as, we really differ, our opinions differ quite radically on this, and I think you should describe this. Well, uh, I don't know, it's, it's of course a really difficult question to answer, but mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that, that the clue is, has to do with what we said at the very beginning, which is that, that we all tend to work against something. We all tend to work uh, by rubbing against what's there and what has been there. And for most of us in the 70s, uh, we, the art that, that we knew, the art that was, that was being shown uh, uh, most powerfully and most successfully at that time was uh, so-called minimal art, which is a term that I don't like, but nonetheless a term that, that has some meaning for people. Uh, a kind of very clean, uh, very intellectualized, very elegant, and very specific art. And I think that a whole group of people felt that something more was possible, both with that vocabulary and with other vocabularies. And in a certain sense, it was a reaction to that. Not a reaction that said that art was bad, but a reaction that said, uh, given this situation, there are other things that can be done as well. And I think that a lot of people began to, to, to want to put more, a more emotional quality, a more, a more uh, 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 another kind of energy into work that used basically the same vocabulary. They wanted to say more about the way in which the work was made and the feelings out of which the way was, it was made. And a lot of people did that in a lot of different ways. And I think that that has been probably the basic thrust of 70s art, both in terms of process art, both in terms of, of so-called conceptual art, which even though it's conceptual, seems to me to be highly romantic and, uh, and, and uh, highly emotional. It's really about, about what it's about, it's about poetry. It's about the kind of words and the kind of, of thought processes that please the people who are doing it. Uh, as well as this, all the so-called post-minimal art and, and uh, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. Before you disagree and I'm not care, I'm still leaving it we that. should, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think, share the fact that Richard Nonis was trained as an anthropologist <laughs> and decided to become a sculptor because as I understand it, you looked for more generalized ways of communicating. Yeah, well, that's pretty Can well you tell clear. us a little bit about the genesis of your own art? Well, uh, just to, f to explain a little bit about what you said, I, I was writing a book. I, I had lived in, in northern Mexico in a very small Indian village for two years, and I was writing a book about it. And I was about halfway done with the book, and what I was really interested in talking about were fairly uh, generalized things about the way people thought, uh, the way people perceived certain things. But the only way I could do it was to be very specific. The only way that I could get to those general points was to be very, very specific about other people's lives. And I decided it was nobody's business. 
<laughs> it just was nobody's business. I didn't want to talk about those people's lives in that direction. Is it because you thought that they would be exposed to larger view well, and in some way corrected yeah, or diluted? But also it was, the, the only reason I knew that was because they had allowed me, by virtue of a very personal kind of relationship, to have that information. So it would be the violation of a privileged community. In a way, I, you know, I don't want to make a fuss about any kind of moral point, but the, the point is I felt that it was too specific. And I began to think about, I, I decided that words were too specific, that that kind of communication almost needed to be that specific and that personal. And I thought about the possibilities of communicating in other ways, where I felt I could deal with things that were just as personal, but much in a much less specific way. And I just began to think about what happened when you put objects together, when you put materials together, when you modified space. And suddenly I, I found myself making sculpture. At first I didn't realize it was sculpture. I mean, it wasn't my intention to make art. But I, I began to realize that what in fact I was doing was what usually is considered, or at that point was beginning to be considered to be art or sculpture. To the work of what are, are other artists do you most respond? Well, I respond to a lot of different work. I, 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 I think I got to it not through other artists, but through the feelings that I had after living two years in the desert, for two years in the desert, in this very strange, flat, uh, uh, environment where all the differences were very, very minor differences, almost invisible at first, and then suddenly absolutely riveting in their, in their, in their, their importance, even though their scale was very small. As far as other artists, there's a whole lot of work, a lot of work, a lot of the minimal work. I, you know, uh, Judd is a great sculptor, and, and, and I, uh, Carl Andre is a great sculptor, and in, in quite another way, Marc de Suvero is a great sculptor. Uh, Marc has an ability to create a kind of energy that almost no one else has done since, uh, uh, though he's working in a way that is uh, not quite the way that I want to work. Uh, I feel very, very close to his work. Now, there's a lot of art that, that, that interests me. But what interests me in each case is a kind of, of emotional power that's done with no bullshit, that's done in a very direct way, no matter how complex or simple it is. I'm looking to, what I want from, from, from the best art, I don't expect it from everything I see, but from the art that moves me the most, is I want to be faced with something that makes me feel as if I've been hit on the head with a hammer. I want to walk into a, into a room and feel like I, I, I'm experiencing something that, that I never even imagined could exist before. And it happens very rarely. But when it happens, it's an extraordinary experience. And that, of course, is the aim. Even though it's an aim that you recognize you can't fulfill very often, if at all. But it's, the, it's, the, it's what I want from art. I'm also interested in, in people's failures, as I'm interested in my own failures. And uh, it's very interesting to watch people fail. Uh, because every, every piece is a relative failure, uh, no matter how good it is. And it's interesting to think of it in, in those terms, too. Uh, it's, Art is, uh, is a very rich uh, uh, universe that you can play with in a lot of different ways. And you find the way that's interesting to you to play with. I assume, tell, tell about being a cowboy, Richard. <laughs> Do, Do that. Sure. On Alana's ranch. <laughs> what about Alaska? Uh, I really asked Barbara if we could just ask Richard to talk about his life. But we <laughs> Richard was a cowboy, too, for a, a number of years. Well, he was also in Alaska, right? Or was it? Yeah, I worked as an anthropologist in the Yukon. In the Yukon. But all of those places are art. You, you can you can get to art in a lot of different ways. You can get to it in a purely theoretical way, in, in in an absolutely formal theoretical way. But the only way you can make really good art from that position is to back off slightly. I mean, your starting point may be absolutely theoretical, but the art has to be something more than theory. Uh, art that is just uh, uh, a kind of description of, of, of something doesn't really work out. It has to be the theory plus something else. Or else you can apply, One you can, of your you can theories, approach the Richard, art from somewhere that, else. That your work is making a room feel different than it did before. Well, when I was turning that idea around, I kept on thinking, well, if you walked into a room, you would make that room different than it was before. Yeah, which is absolutely you true. You put on a light switch. Yeah. Turned on music. The what goes beyond that to make what you create art? What goes through your head when you are working in creating these spaces? Yeah. Well, there, there are two things uh, that, that differentiate between uh, what I feel and, and want to call art and, and almost any experience of modifying a space, anything that you put into a space, or as you say, just by changing the lighting or walking into it. One is that 
that those changes that happen in our everyday life are mostly invisible to us. That is, they don't, they don't force us to deal with them in a way that moves us, in a way that significant, significantly changes how we feel. That happens very rarely, but sometimes it happens in, in, in a natural situation, in an, accident, in, in, in an absolutely uh, accidental situation, but not very often. So that part of the difference is that when you're dealing with this as art, you're trying to make a really significant difference, a visible difference, a, a, a felt difference in how that space affects people, how people feel being in that space. And that's, that's one major uh, differentiation. The other is intention. The other is that, that of, of anything you do to a room changes it, but you're not specifically interested in the way in which that room is being changed. Uh, a sculptor who's doing that is, in fact, directly interested in that point. Uh, and it, it, those two differences. I don't think they're very important, except that the artist is more likely to do it, or more likely to do it more, more often than, uh, than other people. But the best sculpture I've ever seen probably has been accidental. But the problem is that, that very few people have noticed it. Uh, I happened to notice it because it happened to be what I was interested in. Uh, but nonetheless, it's probably the best sculpture I've ever seen. I can't imagine a sculpture that's more specific? powerful than a... Well, I can't imagine a sculpture that's more powerful. OK, let me put it this way. A lot of sculptors have said the same thing in different ways. Tony Smith once said that the most, powerful, the most perfect sculpture he could imagine was uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the New Jersey Expressway before it was open. That is this, this, this 300 mile long, or whatever it is, ribbon of black asphalt with a white line down the center. OK. Uh, Carl Andre once said that the perfect sculpture for him was a railroad track with the cross ties and the two rails continuing out uh, to, the, the, to the horizon. Uh, my feeling is that the perfect sculpture is, is, a, is a field with a fence around it. That is an, uh, 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 an area that's, that's, that's more or less artificially delimited, de uh, delineated. delineated from the, the surrounding space. We're all saying the same thing. We're saying that, 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 the, that, that spaces are constantly being activated by people's lives, uh, but very few people notice it. What Richard has said reflects, at least in my view, part of the philosophy that the Institute, and especially PS1, espoused, which was, and they said, and I quote, we are experimental and we are innovative. But in the two years since you have said that, the Institute has expanded considerably and more and more taken on an institutional quality. One of the earlier quotes was, we are not tied, <laughs> no, it's not that bad. <laughs> we are not tied to long-term planning or complicated decision-making processes. This is two years ago. Therefore, we can be more flexible in our structure and more responsive, that's the price of success, to new art forms and ideas. You have just been awarded $150,000 cash <laughs> by the Thank National Thank you, Barbara. And, uh, here's a little surprise. I knew you were going to pay us for this. <laughs> a little honorarium. A little honorarium. However, this one is coming from the National Endowment for the Arts as part of their national program called a Challenge Grant, where for every $3 of private and local funds that you raise, the federal government will give you $1. The kind of money that is generally given to very establishment institutions. It seems to me that that is a very mixed blessing for you. On the one hand, you need that money as part of your life's blood. On the other hand, it seems to me that willy-nilly, your program will be influenced by the need to raise that kind of funding. Can I? Please. That. Okay. Um, challenge Grant is a very important thing for us. Um, it itself doesn't, doesn't uh, change that. Um, challenge Grant is the Betty Crocker 
seal of approval, institutional approval. The money isn't that enormous as you can quickly figure out three to one or whatever it is. Vast monies would have to be raised. It's a terrific vehicle. It's a terrific vehicle to raise money. Um, we would have to raise that kind of money anyway to continue our activities. The challenge grant will decrease some of our, the horrendous amount of time spent fundraising rather than increase it. The important thing about the challenge grant to an organization like ours is, is that we got it. It's only given to the most austere organizations. Well, it is surely a validation of a it's sort. It's a validation that we're a stable and sound organization, that our bookkeeping is proper, that our, our planning is organized. Uh, it's. It's a grant that it hasn't been given to an artist-related organization before. It's the Metropolitan Opera, the Guggenheim, only museums, only Carnegie Hall, this sort of thing. Uh, we're the first one to get it. Uh, I hope that we fulfill all their expectations in Washington because we've gotten it and then other groups like ours could perhaps be trusted with these kinds of federal hopes and dreams. How do the artists involved feel about they, that? They don't like it. Well, <laughs> I... I will say again that I feel that, that, that most of us as artists work against the situation that's, that, that, that surrounds us. I mean, that's, that's, that's the... Nature. That's just the way, that's just the way that one works. I mean, you, 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 don't, you don't make what already exists. You're trying to, to, to work from that to something else. And the nature of, of the development of the Institute is that the Institute partly now is, is uh, a part of the world that exists. Now, it, it is useful to many artists, but it's also something to react against. It's also something to work against. Now, and part of the way uh, one works against it is to, is to go even beyond what Alana can do. Uh, uh, and there are, there are uh, perhaps, though I don't know of them, so-called alternative spaces that are trying to go beyond the possibilities of what the Institute can now do given their size and their funding and their their situation. Uh, most of the things that we did early in the Institute were totally illegal. They were, uh, there was a lot of dishonesty involved in the sense of, of trying to cheat as much as we could from the city, get anything we could for nothing. Uh, you know, a lot of can't get away with as much of that now. That's fair enough. But there are people who are still perhaps able to do that. But what all I'm saying is that it's, it's, it's absolutely useful because not only does it allow Alana to continue doing the very useful things that she's doing, but it also motivates people to, to work off of her you know, to, to do things that she can't do. And that's, that's just the way it is. One, do you ever worry about becoming a way. museum or assuming any of the problems that museums have, like we're, these major loans? Worry about this all the high time. High upkeep, salaried staff. This is why the challenge grant itself doesn't define the problem. The problem was taking on PS1. Uh, and that was the definitive time in my organization and other organizations when I go around the country and talk to them. We'll have to eventually face the, whether they stop break up and form something else, or whether they mature. You can't stay the same. Nothing in life stays the same for more than a second. And organizationally, administratively, you can't stay the same for more than really two years. Uh, we had to go one way or the other. We went the institutional route. We are a museum, obviously. Uh, we're one, not only a museum. Museum without a collection. We're a museum without a collection where we're more a museum than most of the Kunsthalle, which the museum system we're built off of uh, is a system in Germany. Uh, we're larger than 70% of the so-called museums in the United States. We have a larger budget uh, than 80% of, of museums, which are defined as historical societies and so on and so on. And the word museum in the United States is a very Botanical large... Botanical gardens. It's the, uh, the thing I wish that we were closer to, uh, in terms of administrative establishment definitions, the real category I would like the Institute to come under would be zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and if I felt Close that we could get in <laughs> to the National Zoo Directors uh, organization, I would really try, but no one has ever been able, you know, they have the kind of collection, which is a living collection, right, which I think we should be behind. Now, we've grown up and we face our problems <laughs> and the, our zoo has to be maintained and the people have to be fed. Uh, the thing is that despite what Nonis may think, and we all we fight about this all the time, years have gone by and the, the godmother who has been not called the grandmother in this case, thank God, the artists are getting, a lot of the artists who have worked with us uh, are getting older too. We take sure. in as many younger artists all the time in special project areas, but the, in all kinds of things. But the older artists whose careers have been, in many cases, very favorably 
uh, changed from eight and 10 years ago. They're showing in museums all the time now. Their work takes money. Uh, and we're doing major shows which take major grants. And in general, we're trying to pay artists honorariums, materials, and that's 100 to 150, 200 dollars at a time. 60 artists a term, that's 6,000 dollars a shot. You're at a, you know, we're trying to get money to artists. And unless we get um, on an institutional basis good funding, we're just a drain on the artists. We're asking them to do things free. As it is, generally, they put so much more money than we could ever, ever give them into projects they do at PS1 and Clock Tower and department store shows and all these things. That we, we are a drain, even though we try not to be, uh, in the sense that we're a drain of funds well, and energy. However, you're providing we're, something else. we're providing the space, and we're trying to get a little bit of money to them. And we're trying to set an example for other museums in the country to pay artists for what they do. We do it the best we can. It's only 100 bucks or so with us. Yeah. Who the chooses more we have to get the exhibitions money. in the exhibition space? How is that determined? Who invites the curators, the guest yes. curators? Uh, oh, I, I do, not Brendan. <laughs> Brendan is the chairman of the board, but I'm in charge of, of the program administration. Now, my staff, Brenda, Brenda Wallace, who I should introduce you to, is sitting right there. Brenda, could you wave your arm a second? <laughs> uh, she is formerly the director of visual arts for museums and alternative space in Canada. She's joined us this year. She's the program coordinator. Our staff meets and considers multitude of, of Do exhibitions. Do artists ever select the exhibition? Oh, frequently. It's, there was an artist last year who did a show called Hermetic Aspects of Contemporary Art with John Giordano. Do you think that also, artists Alana can generally... Also, pushed around. Yeah, they push me the around. Interesting, <laughs> the interesting thing is that Alana, as a person, you're not only dealing with somebody who, with, who has a title, you're dealing with, with, a, with a human being in every case. And the thing is that Alana is interested in art. And Alana can be excited about very strange projects. So that while... Uh, an artist may not in every case actually curate a show, an artist can get to a line and say, look, here's a great idea, why don't you work with it? And very often it happens. Do you think in general that artists can choose work better than curators and dealers? Okay, this is a real we'll, well, we'll fight I think they, I think they choose them differently. Uh, you know, I think that artists make horrible shows and curators make even worse shows. <laughs> and occasionally an artist makes a good show and occasionally a curator That's makes a great a good answer. show. 